Hello, world, and welcome to the Millennial Outliers podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Justin Deal, with my main man, Pots and Pans, Tyler Archer and Ty Guy. What's the good word today? What's up, brother? Glad to be back in the booth. It's been I know, a little it's, while, it but uh, we're all, you know, we're busy. All good things. So, you know, pumped to be back, though. Yeah, we're out here growing families, growing businesses, growing biceps, as you always are. <laughs> but we have a uh, special guest that you actually brought in today. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I want to go ahead and, uh, and introduce our special guest. Awesome. Awesome. So um, another uh, guest from the class that I've brought up before on the podcast, the uh, Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business, um, 10K small business owners, I think, right? Um, and... Uh, you know, he was someone, Mehdi, that I, um, I, you know, I talked a lot in, on breaks. Um, we weren't in the same group, right? No, we weren't in the same group. Mm-hmm. No, we weren't in the same group. But um, we talked a lot on like breaks and after class. And um, I think we did a few events that we were kind of, you know, gravitated toward, towards each other. So I um, wanted to bring you on because you got a super cool story, a lot going on, really smart guy. Um, and I think you can bring a lot to the listeners. So. Welcome to the podcast, brother. Oh, man. Thanks for having me. I'm starting to think that you're using uh, Goldman Sachs 10K as just a recruiting event for this. You know, just, <laughs> I, I, I think they call that leverage, <laughs> yeah. right? Is that? I got to yeah. get something out of that class, man. <laughs> no, not, we not learned bad. a lot, but um, but part of it was the network part, you know? Yeah. And Abs- Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, that was one of the, the main reasons for me to be there because just to be in ro- a room with that many entrepreneurs, 100%. It, it really just raises the energy level, kind of yep. gets the juices flowing. Yeah. I mean, because all the people that were in that class were are business owners, to your point. Um, But if they're taking the class, they're people that want to be better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, like you said, we, I, myself always want to be in a room where people want to elevate, people want to grow, grow their businesses. um, They're motivated. So it was an awesome time and awesome class. Yeah. It was just awkward on the first day. I kind of introduced myself and said, Hey, my name's Mehdi. I uh, <laughs> founded Go Vanguard uh, about nine years ago, and I just sold it uh, two days ago. So, <laughs> yeah, that. exactly. Congrats. It was yeah. it was uh, it was awesome because, like you said, we were doing the intros, and I, uh, if I remember correctly, and it might not happen like this, but what I remember is we're doing the intros, and it was like you just found out like that day, I think, right, or something. So I think. The money had just hit my account or something. Was it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what it was. Yeah. Were you bought up uh, by private equity? Or? Um, it was actually a client. I mean, some some uh, uh, private equity there, but it was a, a client of ours that we had done a lot of work for. Um, they had some VC funds as well. They were looking to do expansion through acquisition. And it was just kind of a perfect situation that lined up. Didn't have that exit strategy in mind, but... Just worked out. Yeah, it just worked out. It was the right time in life to do it, too. So, yeah. So let's, let's benchmark that real quick. We're going to absolutely get back to that. But what we really like to start with here a lot of times is, you know, who you are uh, as the individual. Like, where tell us a little bit about your upbringing. The big thing that Tyler and I have realized is a lot of folks think that people have built success just like had the silver spoon. They had all the answers. Things were handed to them. Mm-hmm. And what we really try to push is that we all have the same problems. Successful people just come up with better solutions. So tell us a little bit, like, what was your dynamic with your family? What was yeah, what was sure. young Mahedi's life like? So I grew up in Union City. At that time, it was the most densely populated city in the United States. So oh, I did not know never that. knew that. Yeah, it <laughs> was, uh, you know, based on census data. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that 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 doesn't include the people that were like, oh, it's a census guy. Close the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is probably a lot. <laughs> yeah. And he said he was probably a lot. Yeah. Um, now, what was interesting, though, was about like sixth grade, there was this like influx of technology. Right. So for me, it was like, oh, this is like a big Nintendo. I became a huge nerd, started getting into like really advanced tech. Um, by the time I was in like eighth grade, I was setting up networks for the schools. Sure. By the wow. time I was in high school, we were setting up courses to train people. I had I had worked on the network and computers and databases for basically the whole school system. And so we we fashioned a class around it. So I was this really kind of big tech nerd at that point, right? But what it showed me was there was always a solution or answer to a problem. And it made me really resourceful, right? I had to kind of work within the confines of whatever problem I had, whatever resources were available. And um, yeah, so I think that that was probably one of my my best uh, attributes as an entrepreneur is my, my resourcefulness. So mm. I was kind of becoming an entrepreneur without realizing I was becoming an entrepreneur at that point. Um, so 
many, many uh, stories later, you know, accidentally bringing down uh, the Verizon uh, East Coast Network, trying to play video games with, oh, uh, with some whoa. friends. And, <laughs> well, you got uh, to so, tell so, a little bit yeah, more about that. Happened. I got to hear that, gotta, dude. <laughs> whatever legally you can say, I should say. So, so yeah, one of my, uh, <laughs> so there was this uh, something called Project Explore, and one of my buddies was trying to set up He's trying to play Doom over the network, and they had run T1 lines to all these kids' houses, uh, the, the fortunate ones that were in within the the realm of the the, <laughs> the Verizon the center. And he was just trying to get it up and running, and they're like, "Oh man, the internet's down; it's, it's not working properly." And then it turns out there was this huge, like, major outage, and they pinpointed it back to his house. Oh, wow! <laughs> yeah. So did he get in trouble, or did you guys get? In trouble? Uh, let's just say next year everybody got ISDN lines instead of T1s. Oh. Yeah, but uh, you know, it was, it, it, it's interesting because it was like red teaming, which is what I eventually got into without realizing we were doing red teaming. Yeah. Um, Wait, can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. So red teaming is uh, in penetration testing. Essentially, you emulate the bad guys to test network or physical perimeters to see how you could most easily uh, get into kind of get the crown jewels. So is that mm. based like ethical hacking? Is that exactly? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I like red teaming more. That sounds much more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, red teaming can apply to more than just <laughs> just hacking. But uh, you know, it it's. The thing that's important about red teaming to understand is it's you can't do it uh, internally, right? Mm -hmm. It need you need to have an outside party do it because if somebody is aligned with the company's goals, they're going to have blind spots. So you bring somebody else in and they might not look for the path you think they're going to go in, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to go through the fortified front door. They're going to look for the the window that's open on the side. Yeah. And uh, I can't tell you how many times we would get in through like an unsecured printer or something just crazy and, and mm. end up taking that one little opening and escalating it to getting to, you know, domain admin access. So, wow. mm. but yeah, taking that back, you know, winding that back, uh, I could tell you in, my high school, two weeks before graduation, uh, I remember I had access to every single computer in my school system <laughs> because at one point I had touched them all and uh, you know, non-maliciously, I had installed software on all of them so I could remotely access them so I could work on them if I had to, right? And I was like, you know what? I got access to all these machines. I got access to all these school databases. I never really did anything malicious. Uh, I was like, I need to kind of hand this down to the next generation so i handed it down to one of my buddies and within two days i was in the, the principal's office changing some grades <laughs> yeah, he, well, well he didn't change any grades but he i mean he blew it up right oh. and like it was something i had kind of kept on the down low uh, uh within uh yeah two days i'm in the principal's office uh getting threatened for litigation oh, and wow. then uh within the same meeting uh now we're best friends and he's patting me on the back and asking me for some tips so <laughs> crazy that's on i love that just at that young of an age like you figured out such a a complex skill Technical. set yeah. yeah like most of us were just out playing sports being big <laughs> yeah. dummies in sixth and eighth grade right just starting to chase girls and you're you're bringing down yeah you know. bringing down networks yeah <laughs> well we're building them too but yeah. uh yeah. and building the school right even more importantly right yeah yeah i think they were just getting cheap labor but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no but it was uh it was, it was really cool time you know we got access to some some tech that you know we might have not had otherwise and i feel like if you just that's what everybody needs is just opportunity. You know, yeah. if you if you can extend that opportunity, it's, then then it, then they have no excuse. It's what you do with that after the fact. So. Well, they said that and I'm all about equal opportunity, not equal outcome. Right. Like Absolutely. We all have to create our own outcomes with the opportunities that we either create or, you know, through the blessings of other people or God are given. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can start people off at the same level and they're not all going to end at the same finish line. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I always say that with money, right? Like wealth is a mindset. So you could give everybody a million dollars and two years later, the wealthy people would have all the money and the people that would typically be broke would be right back to square one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. That's like lottery winners, you know? Right, yeah. All, yeah. How many of them go broke? <laughs> yeah. Right? Or even the- yeah, Athletes. I was just going to say athletes yeah. that there was a whole 30 for 30 on that. Yeah. You hand people a ton of money that don't really know what to do with it. Yeah, same thing arenas, with an opportunity aquariums and shit. Right. Yeah. i mean it's like well there's also kind of the hunger aspect too mm -hmm. right like how do you stay hungry after you've already been fed so well yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. that's true and that's something i like to see in entrepreneurs i work with is that, that hunger factor like well you know the, the desire to get to that next mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, and I think that's what you see in a lot of successful entrepreneurships that uh, entrepreneurs, they're looking for how can I be better constantly? And it's not so much like, well, I just need to get to that level. It's a process of refinement and yep. to continuously get better. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So, um, so we we got through high school. Now, what, where are you at after that? So I went to college, um, had a, a fun couple years there. Hmm. Uh, second semester, again, you know, we, we, we grew up in Union City. We weren't very well off. Um, my father lost his job and uh, one of his investments in like some real estate, his partner pulled out hmm. and he was like, I'm not sure I can continue to pay for your tuition. So I said, all right, I'll figure it out. I'll do student loans. I did one semester of that and I said, this is for fools. <laughs> oh, I, smart by you. <laughs> yeah. So, so I ended up, you know, again, trying to be resourceful. I got a full-time job at Rutgers, which meant I could attend for free. Mm, nice. So I was working at a, in a biotech lab doing IT. So I got a little taste of the, the biotech world there, which was, was interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got to kind of, uh, I think I have still have probably like 18 credits remaining. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I kind of was like, you know, I don't really see a point in doing this. Uh, a degree is not going to help me in this career. Mm -hmm. It was great for networking, but I s decided to just cut my teeth and do consulting. I, w I went into uh, Manhattan, started working for a bunch of other consulting firms. Mm -hmm. I, we were working for all of these businesses. And I got to the point where I was doing the tech, the full cycle sales. I was doing everything except the back office. And I said, you know what? I can, I can do this for myself. And I decided to, to do that. You know? How old were you when, when that happened? Say I was about uh, 28, 29 when I decided to, yeah, yeah. to kind of venture out. That's but, awesome. Yeah. So I had that experience in the, the business world. I just, I was like, oh, you know, the back office stuff, I'll figure that out. <laughs> that's the hardest stuff like, yeah, oh, yeah exactly <laughs> operations is always people yeah, realize employees that. all that I, I had no respect for operations going into entrepreneurship <laughs> yeah. and uh, you knew you're and a lot of entrepreneurs do that too yeah. um not to not to uh discredit you on, on like the operations side most people are like that where you knew the specialty you knew the it you knew all that mm -hmm. you had to learn the operations and everything like that brutal brutal but new respect for people in operations absolutely especially people that do it well yeah. and document it and have processes mm -hmm. that stuff is beautiful yeah so. well especially as you know with selling your company it's vital right like for you, uh, to do, you have due to diligence have, yeah <laughs> oh, man. if you don't have those kind of processes in place and if you can't remove yourself from that company and it still is profitable people don't want to buy you yeah 100 percent. and fortunately that's something that we did really well and kind of going into the, the gs10 ksb uh, program i had actually gone through a lot of those steps myself prior and thank god i did because when you go to sell your business it is a proctology exam oh yeah <laughs> you know, they due really, diligence is months yeah. yeah i mean you you you've been through it as yeah. well yeah so it was it was a serious process <laughs> it's a list like this law oh man and, and and then they come back with additional lists like, uh -huh, well, we found uh -huh. this, so we're gonna need yeah. to look at these, these attorneys things. involved oh and, yeah. yeah i mean it was, it was a long process so actually by the time i initially applied to the program we we weren't there was no offer yet like there was some interest but there was no uh, uh they didn't begin any due diligence process or anything like that so by the time we got to the end, I was like, well, I already signed up for this class. I committed to it. I took a spot. I better go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm glad I did. You know, I got to meet some really interesting people. And Definitely. So what was the mindset you, that you then took into that class, right? Because now you didn't have the yeah, business like, so much business. to speak, to, to really build on. Did you use that time just networking? Like, what's my next venture going to be? Or That's exactly what I did. So you know, I have a bit of a non-compete for a few more years. So I knew I wasn't going to go right back into cybersecurity. But I started to build, um, my plan was to start uh, some real estate investments. And an idea I had with my brother-in-law, who was a recovering, well, is a recovering addict, was to open up some sober living homes. Nice. So there was like a huge need for them. Mm -hmm. um, on paper, the, the business model is great. It's about, you know, 30% margins if you Ooh. can run it really effectively. Nice. It's a lot more management than typical mm -hmm. real estate, but the margins though yeah. wow <laughs> yeah well i mean in an ideal situation there's a lot of turnover right but sure. you know so more realistically you can say 20 percent. but which is still great which is still for, great yeah. yeah for most businesses <laughs> yeah so um 
I used that time to build that business idea and build on that. And it was, it was interesting because I came in there as kind of like a tech guy and everybody's like, whoa, sober living homes. What's that? <laughs> but, you know, when, when you make an exit, you have to work on your semi-passive income investments. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that was the plan. So I'm, I'm building that up for the next couple of years. I'm doing a little bit of consulting on the side and then uh, start my next one. Love it. What would you say? What are some of the biggest hurdles with this new venture that you, you find yourself running into? Well, I mean, being a novice in any industry is is, is you're learning again, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you, it's this process of consistent learning. Um, so there's that, and then there's just state regula regulations mm -hmm. and, and navigating that those hurdles and roadblocks. Very limited information. So that's probably the major hurdles. And then there's the ones that you don't expect. Um, you know, any business that's dealing with people, <laughs> you mm -hmm. better expect there's going to be yeah. some interesting hurdles that, that pop up. Yeah, uh, something new every yeah. <laughs> every month. <laughs> every, yeah, every, every every day, every week with some, some of these things. But that's why I, so the first thing I I do knew was I wanted to get an operator for the business. I wasn't going to start up a semi passive uh, investment that there you wasn't an operator. I didn't want to run the day to day. Yeah, right. So my goal after exiting was to set up two or three businesses that I could work in, um, like one day a week, and kind of get those up and running. And, you know, with the understanding that some things are going to be like projects and I'd have to dedicate like a period of time to them, like every time we get a new property or something. But uh, in order to do that, to be successful, I knew I had to find a business. I had to find an operator that could fit into that business and run it properly, right? Under, you know, some guidance and some assistance from me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now with, um, to backtrack just a little bit, how um, how many employees did, you, did your company have that you sold off? Like how, how big did you grow sure. it? And yeah, so so I started Go Vanguard initially as a IT consulting business, right? Where we would work with small to medium businesses and provide technology solutions. We would help them from everything from email to the systems that ran their business, their business processes, um, even you know desktop support servers, networking, all that jazz. We started to find niches, uh, niches and, and specialties, right? Um, we did DevOps for a little while when that was getting big, and you know the cloud. We helped with the migrations. But we had an opportunity to kind of back into cybersecurity. There was a, another firm, and because we had the talent to do so, uh, we had we, we were getting outsourced to the work to do these pen tests. We got so good at it, we, they ended up giving us all of their work. Mm. And we kind of decided this is the business that we wanted to get into. So it was really a, it was a really difficult decision because you have to kind of cut off your nose in spite of your face. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we had to kind of close the chapter on one business to really focus on another, but it was the right decision. I mean, the margins were there, better quality of life for everyone. Um, I kind of describe it as like when you're in IT, you're like the janitor, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. it's like, this needs to work. Very low respect. But <laughs> yes. when you're in cybersecurity, um, you're the magician, right? Mm, right? Oh, this guy has the knowledge and the specialty. Uh, you know, how does he do what he does? Nobody knows. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, you broke in. Wow, you're amazing. Thank you for making uh, our our, our uh, business more secure. Oh, you couldn't break in. Oh, that's amazing. So our 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 our, uh, our security kept you out. That's that's great. Thank you for. You know, but still, it's the same check. Still, mm -hmm. the same level of respect. There wasn't too many times that we didn't get in, but. <laughs> <laughs> I would assume the nice yeah. part was, well, not nice, uh, but you know, with all the ransomware attacks that were going out there, you didn't have to worry about education as much, right? I would assume 15 always, years ago, you had to educate people on why cybersecurity was, and now people are like, man, I see all these huge companies getting hacked. There's there's no reason I can't get hacked. So it's a good thing you brought up education because one of the things that convinced me to pivot to cybersecurity was educating the customer. If you have to educate the customer, that just extends your sales mm -hmm. cycle, right? Um, and we wanted really quick sales cycles. You know, we were a small business. I'm sorry, answering your question you had previously, we, we grew the company up to 25 employees at one point. And when I sold it, there was 11 or 12. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, so then that was like a good sized team. Yeah. But uh, the sales cycle, we didn't go after customers that didn't already see the value and want the service that we had to to give. So we had a qualification process in our mm -hmm. funnel. And a lot of times we would just tell people, you're not ready for a pen test. Here are some material we made. Do these things. Come back to us. And that goodwill really paid off because we did end up getting some clients in the end. Repeat. Yeah. Like come back. We, we got referrals. 
Yeah. So <clears throat> really not just trying to sell people on things, but actually trying to do the best work we could and having a yeah. very narrow focus made a huge difference. That's really smart, yeah. actually. I love that you, you basically gave them some tools, but also you wanted to see that they had skin in the game. Like, are you actually going to execute on any of this? And if you come back to me and you say, hey, yeah, we checked all six of these boxes. This has helped. Do you think we're ready yet? Like now, that, that's actually, that's that's genius. It gives a little bit of that prestige too, where it's like, yeah. you know, oh, I guess yeah, they don't like, want to work with We don't just work with everybody. Like yeah. you guys just aren't. Like you you don't understand. You don't, like it would, I would have to charge you way too much money and it would take too much time yeah. to actually get you to where you need to be. So I love that. Yeah. And, you know, it's something we were able to to, to do relatively quickly too. Um, and I think by putting out that, that goodwill and putting out that material for businesses to, to follow, um, it really set us apart as like leaders and particularly for that very specific niche, mm -hmm. because you go to some of the larger companies and they're very sales oriented. You know, they have teams, they've got quotas. They're going to sell you something no matter what, even if you need it Biz or not. Dev people mm -hmm. and yeah, because you're getting paid on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that was one thing that we want really wanted to make sure was not part of our culture. Yeah, which you're, you guys are more, and it's kind of similar to, to my business, uh, more experts mm -hmm. in that field. Yeah. And um, you're not just trying to sell whatever you can. You're, you know, you're, you're really filing down that customer to, you know, who's going to work best with you, who's going to give you the least amount of stress, sales cycle. You know, yeah, yeah. So we reduced our sales cycle down to about like three days to a week. You know, nice. we would turn quotes out in like 24 hours. Speeding that up really gave us an edge. And then uh, most of our engagements would last about two weeks, mm. you know, so from start date, signing of the agreement um, to the end, producing a report about two weeks and awesome. you know, able to we're able to turn those over. And you know, this minimum engagement was really about 10K. So, mm. yeah. So now you're kind of you're obviously not in that industry anymore right now for folks who are kind of on that fence. What are some things that they should either, what are questions they should be asking if they're looking to outsource cybersecurity? What are some red flags that maybe that's not the best company to work for? Any tips you would have for the audience? I would say um, don't outsource your cybersecurity processes for your internal kind of blue team, right? That's like the defenses because you're, and again, there's a lot of different situations. You know, some Sometimes it makes sense, but if, in any business process, if you outsource it and you don't have a good documented process, you create information silos. When you create those information silos, if something disappears, that information disappears. And now you have a big hole in your business. So in terms of owning your own cybersecurity program, owning your own technology, you have to make sure that you have those pro documented processes and that if you have to detach that part, you still have it and you can put somebody into that system. Um, for what we did was red teaming. Um, that is something that you can do internally, but you really need to bring someone outside because again, they're not, they don't have those blind spots. They're not uh, attached to the company's goal and vision. Um, so that's where we kind of came in and fit in. And we were able to work with huge businesses. Um, we were able to work with like multinational banks, you know, insurance mm. companies. Um, I would say, you know, top 500, 100 businesses. I mean, just massive. And uh, we we gained a prestige as the guys that that could get it done. Mm. And it was great because I remember having to work with as as a in IT solutions. I remember working with like Unilever and some of those like larger companies. And we had just had to jump through so many hoops. We had to increase our insurance premiums. Yeah. But once we became that red team uh, that you wanted to hire, they were like, oh, well, we'll just accept that. It's acceptable risk. No worries. You, know, you don't have to change your policy. No problem. Mm. So yeah, it was, it was very interesting how uh, that flipped. When, when yeah. businesses really want to work with you, they make it happen. Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, especially yeah. those size institutions. I mean, kind of to the point you're making is they just have so much important data that can't go out, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and those are the targets, right? Like, of course, you're going to hit a, a multinational bank that's got everybody's socials and account numbers and offshore, like all this this data that everybody on the dark web, I'm sure, wants. Oh, right? Yeah. And and another thing too was in identifying our customers, mm -hmm. we looked at. Uh, customers that had regulatory obligations to do pen tests. Mm. So it's like, listen, they have this money, they're going to spend it. The only thing we really had to plan for was the people that waited to the end of the year to spend that money <laughs> and mm. deal with the, the the rush, right? So we would 
literally our fourth quarter, we would literally just line up all of our engagements and say, our bucket's full. So if you want to get in, get in now. Yeah. Right, right, right. Which turned out to be a good sales sales process. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, so what got you started with like those very large companies? Like, did you organically meet them? Or was it like one account that kind of ads, broke into the mold? Or yeah. Or, yeah. So we started working with another com company and we'd start taking over their book and they initially got referrals through another startup and someone that was connected with them. As soon as you get into one, you start meeting people in the community, you kind of have that magnetic effect, right? Yeah. People leave one, one organization, go to another. Um, but I think reputation is really what does it. And mm -hmm. it did it for us in the IT side of things. And it did it for us in the cybersecurity side of things too. It just takes a while. You know, yeah. a lot of people don't realize, but you have to really put the work in and not be afraid of failure. Um, failure is a, is a major part of entrepreneurship and learning. Yeah. And failing quickly. That was one of the, the biggest lessons for me was being able to figure out this isn't working and then move into the next thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we built that into our business processes where, you know, we would do a postmortem for even successful projects, right? What went well, what went poorly, what can we improve? And having that system of constant refinement really made the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, how, so you started this company and then, you know, you sold it right at the beginning of this class. How long did you have that company? Nine years. Okay. Yeah. yeah so. Did you did you acquire other smaller companies in the process as you were scaling? We, we acquired that one cybersecurity company that was outsourcing all the work to us, and mm -hmm. we took the name on. And then, um, upon acquisition, they used that brand, it was Gotham Security, okay. as as the uh, prevailing brand name. So, mm. yeah. Like that you said about failure too. I heard it saying yesterday, or I read it somewhere. And it was like you can't make millions without a couple L's, and I was like, oh, yeah, "Man, that is! I'm putting that on a shirt. That, that's good. <laughs> Need more people to see that." Yeah, yeah. Because I think people do; they don't realize like fail, like every successful person's failed more times than they succeeded. Yeah, just the success was that much greater. It's like the one hit wonder in music, right? There's record labels used to spend money on a hundred acts for one of them to actually make it, and that one paid for all the losses of the other ninety nine. Yeah. It's like the VC model, you yeah, know? Right? <laughs> like, yeah. Bet on a hundred, hit on one. Yeah, and make your money back plus yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, and, more. yeah, and way yeah. more. Yeah. So no, I mean, failure is a, a really important lesson, um, and something I, I try to teach when I'm training other leaders, uh, when I'm doing consulting work, you know, even with my kids. I mean, I think I was, I was telling you, uh, signed my kids up for jujitsu about five years ago. Nice. How old are your kids now? My oldest is twelve. My under him is nine, and I have a daughter at five who right. just started jujitsu, and then I've got another one six months. That's ah, awesome. you're in the four kid club. Let's go, yeah. big dog. <laughs> Same. Don't know when yeah, to stop. Congrats on the, the six month. I don't think I didn't. I don't think we knew that in the class, did we? Or maybe um, we I wasn't really like announcing. Yeah, stuff, yeah, but, yeah. You know, That's awesome, man. Congrats. Business. I already told you guys he sold his company. All yeah. right, how much more info you want out of this, man? <laughs> yeah. Jeez, yeah. I want to know your whole life. Yeah. 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 No, so I mean, it was just good tonight. Yeah. Two girls, two boys. I think we're done. 41 now so i don't oh, think wow. i got much energy left in me to raise, <laughs> raise a fifth so Thanks you're in that you're in the critical stages though with that you know age group 9 and 12 and everything oh i'm in it i'm yeah. in it deep yeah <laughs> well, the deep. 12 and 6 month old that's i'm praying for you brother that's <laughs> yeah. a lot right there two girls but it's yeah. all right i've got my uh my gun collection back <laughs> yeah. up, so. that's right uh, but back to uh the failure aspect so my wife she asked me she's like well, well why jujitsu and i was like well for one it's grappling. So, you know, they'll be able to handle themselves without the bloody nose. They won't end up in the principal's office, mm, yep. but also they're going to learn to fail a lot, which is especially in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the, even, I mean, even as you go on, like yeah. the there's same. always somebody better beating you up in jujitsu. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. The, like, there's no black belt that hasn't, you know, tapped a thousand times. Mm, right. Yeah. So that whole concept of like red teaming now, like we're doing competitions and taking them out there and like seeing a kid lose is like heart wrenching, mm, you know? Yeah. But, teaching them that hard lesson to get back up and mm. do it again and use that to teach yourself how you can get better. That's basically red teaming, you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's what we're doing, except you're, you're putting it on the line. You're, you're testing your skills and you're getting real world feedback. What's working, what's not working. And then you can either crumble, you know, if you, if you don't get it, or you can take that data and try to go back to the dojo, get better, improve, test yourself again yeah you know, I, I i tell my kids stories about you know 
competitors that lost all of their matches until they got to purple or brown belt. And you know, we're talking like seven, eight years. years you know, yeah. they, you just got to keep getting back up. And yeah. Doing it. So, so you sound like you have a great growth mindset. Do you like, are you in coaching communities? Obviously you took this class, but do you invest in personal development in any other way? Um, I do with a, a couple, I have like a group of friends that mm. we, we do that. Um, I'm also in my, ironically, the, the jiu-jitsu school I'm in, Princeton Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has uh, quite a few interesting characters that it's sure. attracted from all, all different walks of life. And, you know, we do a couple leadership books here and there. Um, Princeton's a great community in general. It's a great area to be around. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a great area to raise your family. Mm-hmm. So live next door to a farm. You know, it's yeah, it's great. Can't beat it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, so yeah, I mean, we're I'm I'm always focused on on growth and learning new new things, um, and I'm, my kids' schedule right now is like so packed. So I'm like, I'm at the point now where I'm starting to see the fruits of my labor. Cause you can like, do all this stuff with them. Yeah. I can do it with them. And then also like my 12 year old is starting to plan his day. And like, he's like, I have to study for these tests. Right. And like, I oh, don't have to awesome. push him or tell him to do anything. And we're setting that example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or well, you set that example. Yeah. Yeah. More so their mother, but <laughs> there you go. But, props uh, to mom. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> But yeah, no, no, he's bringing home a report card full of A's and like, we're not pushing so awesome. him to do anything. And I was like, oh man, this is paying off. All right. Yeah. yeah. You know, I guess, I guess something's working. Yeah. 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 That's, that's so awesome. So um, now moving back to the IT world, cause I wanted to just get into this real quick um, just cause it's such a hot topic. So the whole AI world, um, I know in the class we were, you'd be like the go-to guy. Like someone has an AI question, ask Mahadi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's moving so quickly, right? Yeah. And I think you just have to follow the tools that are getting popular because it can save you so much time as an entrepreneur. I oh, mean, there's God. there's things I used to do that would take so long and they're just so obnoxious. Like anything with writing. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Anything with writing or anything with like like just sending out like holiday announcements, right? Yes. Like yeah. you know, oh I've got to find the art. I can do that. All right. That's it was like a half hour, 45 minutes of your your week, right? Because you gotta type it out, you gotta yeah. read it. You're like, exactly. Right, you gotta get a couple different eyes on it so you don't send yeah. out something stupid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh now with AI, it takes five minutes, you mm-hmm. know. It's great. Uh, made a lot more processes a lot more enjoyable. Now, I will advise against AI for some situations. Uh, you got to be careful with like, it's called hallucinations. Um, it will it says everything, like it's very authoritative and it knows exactly what's right. And, but it's not always right. So make sure you check check your uh, chat GPT output. Yeah. But, um, Especially and, the images. I saw the one couldn't couldn't seem to, to create history properly. Oh, that was that's Gemini. Yeah. I don't know if you want to get into a DEI. That might be a little bit of a sensitive yeah. topic. Yeah, there, no but. doubt. <laughs> that was, it was definitely interesting to see a black George Washington though. Yeah. <laughs> so so there's there's kind of a movement going on in Google right now. Um, DEI was such an important initiative there that they were in the meetings with developers, and to the point where it it change the outcome of the product mm. Mm. so i mean i'm a proponent for dei but i feel like the pendulum swung a little bit too far in that side to the point where like dei should be involved in the organization not in the product development yeah. right yeah be careful right so. right right so you know with the emerging the emergence of ai and everything you know there's also a lot of people that are afraid they're going to you know, lose their jobs and, and all that stuff. And I know we talked about this in the class and you had a great response about it and everything. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are- Were stay, Terminators coming? <laughs> stay, stay with the times. I mean, right now, the most popular AI are LLMs, large language learning models. This is not going to replace a human. This is literally just algorithms predicting the next best word, right? And that's why it can hallucinate. Um, it's not going to be AGI- they, they, they can make it do, you know, some fancy tricks. Um, but ultimately, this is a tool to save you time. Learn it. Use it. It doesn't, it, there's a very small learning curve. Also, be strategic about it. You can actually role play with ChatGPT and say, this is my business. You're the marketing manager. I need campaigns for this, this, and this. Or right, what questions would you ask me? Um, and you can actually utilize it in a fashion like that, where you might be able to shift some responsibilities to Chad GPT. Um, 
you'll still have to manage it though, right? Like even with employees, you have to manage them. You always have to allocate a little bit of time for that. Same thing with these technologies, but it might save you from hiring a marketing firm if you're a small business, right? Mm -hmm. It might save you from having to write customer responses. Um, yeah, so definitely take advantage of them. The only things I would say is like, be careful about like outsourcing your help desk to it or you know your customer support because you have to weigh the cost benefit there because it's it, it's going to hallucinate on you and it's going to say promise something to your customer because the algorithm says it's the next best word um, and if it doesn't align with your business you might have to Could be bad <laughs> yeah exactly it's happened already so yeah yeah so is Terminator coming. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't worry about it yet. I think we're probably still a few years away from AGI, but I we're talking a lot about AGI. I, though, just, right? I thought Elon was building robots as we speak now. Oh well, yeah, robots. I mean, yeah. that's so. So there's the the AI, which is uh, AI would essentially be think about a uh, technology that has the ability to learn and make decisions on its own, right? Like right now, the AI that we're using is a LLM. It's, it's based off of inputs, right? Mm -hmm. So like you're giving it a whole bunch of data and then it's learning that data and then it's using user responses to make, to understand what would be the best decisions. And then there's like a safety layer, you know, so you can't make it do off the wall things, mm -hmm. but that's not gonna be thinking for itself and coming up with, uh, you know, philosophical responses to how you feel about certain things. This is just using a data set. With AGI, you should be able to give it nothing, right? And or, or just very basic information, like you would a child as you're teaching them. And it should be able to come up with ideas on its own, but a hell of a lot faster, mm -hmm. right? Like we're talking about hundreds, hundreds of years of evolution within minutes. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So so that's why everybody's scared because it's taken us this long to get here. And within like a day or two, AGI should be like years ahead of us. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, definitely, it's a little scary. It is a little scary. Yeah, but <laughs> that's what everyone's. And then what's a lot of people battle with, um, cause I know the Google guy came out and said that their Bard or whatever had, he believed it had a consciousness. Um, what's your, you know, what I mean, to you, what defines a consciousness? Like, right. Is AGI that, um, if it's thinking on its own or. So here's the thing, right? Like there's, there's like neural networks that are, made to work like human brain works and there's all these different uh technologies like if you look at how nature does things it takes a longer time to get there but it usually comes up with like the most efficient way like i i don't know how much energy our brains use but it's like you know, really small like mm -hmm. inconceivable amount of energy compared to like a processor yep. right mm -hmm. um if you look at like a bird's flight it is so aerodynamic. I mean, its bones are light. Like the way that it can fly or like insects is just you know, advanced for physics. It. Yeah, yeah, right. Now, if you look at how humans have achieved flight, it's, well, we're going to try to ride the wind, but you know what? We're just going to put a little bit more power into it, right? We're going we're gonna to we're gonna create artificial thrust and we're just going to fucking do it, right? We're just yeah. going to take off, right? Yep. Now, we think that we'll get to AGI by rebuilding a neural network similar to how a human brain works, but that might not be the case. It might be we just put a little bit more fucking horsepower into it and we get mm. something that we're not expecting out of it. Right. So that's the that's the worry. But I think that humans can also buy into their own kind of hallucinations as well, mm. right? Like you're you're in there, you're seeing these things happen that you can't really explain. Um, your your mind can take you certain places as well. So yeah, I'm glad we've got so many eyes looking at it. Um, I would just also just be careful. It's a you know, big buzzword right now. It's like machine learning has been replaced by AI. So just be be careful about adopting new tools. Things are are coming and going as quickly as they they they, they pop up. So if you're building it into your business process, uh, just be careful about that. Yeah, yeah, because it could change on a dime. Yeah, you don't <laughs> have something you rely on, and then poof, uh, yeah, sorry, it's gone. Money dried up. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it's crazy. Now switching back to um, the the newer venture. So how are you guys kind of identifying like what areas you want to uh, get homes in? And I assume do you are you renting these places rather than purchasing? Because I, I assume we're, that could be a problem in certain neighborhoods. So we're we're purchasing them. Okay. Um, and you know some people rent them, but there's a little bit more of a logistics you have to go through. The, the okay. owner has to be on the the, the licensing. Okay. So 
you, know, you, you it, it would have to be a very interesting relationship to, for them to agree sure. to that. Yeah. Um, but um, we are identifying places where there is a huge need for sober living, right? Where um, people are going to meetings and they're asking about sober living and there's either a waiting list for houses or there's just no availability. Um, so right now we're focusing on uh, Tom's River, okay. which, I mean, the real estate market there is blown up. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like right at the, the, the peak where we might have to find a new location for the business model to continue to work. But right now, still kind of fits um and yeah we're, we're looking to have you know, five to ten houses in the next like two years nice so it's the plan that's and awesome. what are the typical like sizes you look for is it something that's multi-bedroom obviously yeah just... so we look for houses that have the ability to go up to five or six bedroom okay. um so we'll typically look for like a three to four bedroom and with like an unfinished basement or something right and we you know, we, we, our goal is to get 10 guys in each house. Okay. Right. And that's, that's the, the, that's what makes it economical. Like, mm -hmm. because these guys are paying per bed per week. Right. And for the, the business model to work, um, we need to get 10 guys in each house. We can, it works with like up to seven, six is like break even. Mm -hmm. um, from from our numbers, but so like right now we're buying these homes, we're getting them licensed, and then we're going through the state for the construction permits because you don't have to deal with the local uh, municipalities. Oh, interesting. State. Yeah. So you don't have to pull permits or anything through the. Now you do it through the state, and their whole goal is to make sober living homes easier to operate. And and run. I was going to say now, does that make um, because you know we have that common bond with the real estate side. And, you know, um, dealing with different towns and stuff like that, like now that I've been doing it for as long as I have, I know what towns like, oh, that guy's that that, you know, building officials a pain yeah. in the ass. <laughs> is the state like sim more simple? Is it actually more simple? Um, I'll let you know when I go through it. But from what I've heard <laughs> from other people that have done it is they saved thousands of dollars doing it this Interesting. way. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Now with the sober living, is that someone you were saying they pay per bed? Is that is the individual paying that? Does insurance kick in? Is it a split? It depends. Okay. Um, we're not really at the point where we're working with any insurance. There's okay. like some grants that some that, that some people come in with. Sometimes it's family help. But the whole point of this is that people get back on their feet, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they move in, they come in with two weeks rent and they need to find a job. That's one of the requirements. We've got a whole list of, you know, house rules and you know, the idea is that these guys aren't going to stay there forever. Like mm -hmm. the typical stay in sober living is like six months to 18 months. Okay. Okay. All right. So we want these people to Are get Are they locked in feet. for that long? Like, do they sign a lease or? There's, there's no lock in. These oh, guys can come and go as they please. Now, does that make you, um, now that you've been doing it for a little bit, does that, uh, like you can't, you can't kind of predict some things, right? Like, does that throw numbers off for you and stuff? So that's why it's important to have multiple houses and that's why it's important to kind of maintain those minimum quotas right that's why i can tell you six is our break even yeah. seven we can still operate 10 is the money spot so if i've got and then as i as i add more homes there's some resources i share between them some costs that get shared between them as well but uh yeah, so we, we can kind of spread it out so that way it still maintains Overall. profitability. It right. sounds like you're you're identifying good enough space or areas that there's technically going to be a waiting list for you. So even God forbid two guys, you know, for whatever reason, they just leave. Yeah. There's going to be able to kind of backfill that. Yeah, I mean, there's situations where like you bring one bad apple in and they mess up, you know, everybody half the house or everybody the else. Yeah. Or the house. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we, we're very careful about that process. And, you know, they Do you, like interview them. Yeah, and there's meetings every week, right? So everybody comes together, requires to do a house meeting. I've got a guy that runs it who also runs, you know, other programs. So he can identify that, you know, toxic behavior that mm -hmm. could potentially throw off a group. Yeah. And then once, you know, you get a, a good vibe with the group, it's a lot less management. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to, um, uh, I think it was Rogue in one of, the, one of the episodes, not too long ago, like maybe a month or two. And uh, this guy was, I've, he's a comedian. Um, and you know, in the comedy world, they go through a lot of this, you know, hardships and stuff like that. And he was at a sober living house, um, for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or something. And then he went like on a bender, disappeared for like four days and then went back and he got caught like out front of the house, like drinking and stuff. And they had to kick him out. But, uh, 
I'm I'm sure there's crazy stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, we do uh, drug tests and alcohol testing, and you know, it's. I didn't even know there was alcohol testing. What is it like blood test or? Yeah, no. There's uh, there's strips. Mm. There's a lot of different like. I don't, I don't get too involved in that yeah, side yeah, of things, the, but they just we. You're we've not got, standing outside of the bathroom door yeah. knocking. You're like, That's yeah. the operations guy. I, I, <laughs> I just I just make sure that uh, the supplies need to. Need, I got them all on Amazon subscription. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> they just come in. They just come in if they need something that they let us know. Sure. But, yeah. So so I mean they're they're running the really the kind of the operations there, but yeah if. And and the goal of this business is to help people, you mm-hmm. know, and I try to remember that. Because there's some of these places that are just they, they cram as many people in, yeah. and they're like, "Oh, this is a real estate play." But I really want to do something that was given back to the community too, because I feel like, you know, if the ele- if you ride the elevator at the top, you know, send it back down, try to try to do something to help out. Absolutely, yeah, I love that. So, you know, it's you can do well by doing good, perfect, right? So, yeah, win win. Yeah. So, so have you um have you dove into other facets of real estate? Like, are you getting other long-term rentals? Um, yeah. So what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm lining up a few flips now that we've yep. got the sober living thing kind of settled. And I'm also looking for more long-term holds as well. So I, I'm not sure I wanted to take on a whole flip project and then turn that into sober living just because I'd rather get the cash out and turn mm-hmm. it into more more properties. Yeah. Um, Have you done one yet? A, a flip? Yeah before like in a previous uh life okay. yeah, i have but, yeah yeah um and like my parents had a multifamily building that you know we we renovated every apartment we mm. sold it my mom's like retiring on those funds now so, uh, nice. so awesome yeah. so you've seen firsthand the uh you know just like the power of, yeah, of real, real estate, estate. Yeah. oh yeah absolutely i mean i i'm a big believer in hedging right so you know i've got investments in crypto i've got investments in uh stock markets you know i've got different funds and now real estate's kind of the the next the other uh, one next era for me yeah, yeah. diversification yeah. Yeah, yeah right absolutely how uh what's bitcoin doing nowadays <laughs> i know it jumped like crazy right yeah. and then just, and then i think it went down again or just have yeah man but i think i think long term yeah a lot of people are still like crypto's going to zero you know and for a little while, I was like, maybe, you yeah. know, it's it's definitely a risk. <laughs> of course, that's I when know. I sold. <laughs> then it looked like it was going to go to 100K. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it hit like 70 something. But yeah. Yeah. what I look at is the level of maturity it's reached, right? Like there, it's- And now it's, it's been in, how long? 10 years, it's 15 in, years? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been in ETFs. It's it's now included yeah. in like the balance sheet of you know, Fortune 500 businesses. Ah, so that's, you know, it's- Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's become too big to fail right now, yeah. right? You know, the, it's to the point where the government has said, "All right, you know, it's it's an asset. We're 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 fine with it. Yeah, yeah it's not a, a security. So, yeah, yeah. it's it, I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, you just gotta be careful with um the like the meme type coins the sh- and the all shit that. coins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, watch, I mean, there's so many specials about you know those types of things going wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I watched one recently. It was crazy. <laughs> like 95% of crypto is like a grift. Yeah. Like, yeah. But yeah. 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 That doesn't mean that in any emerging markets, there's always going to be grifters. grifters. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. You know, there's opportunity too. Like I know people that got rich off a of Dogecoin. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I did well. And then yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, Tried riding that wave, you know, yeah, diamond you, hands didn't work out. <laughs> you gotta, you, you just gotta measure the risk, you know, and yeah. don't be too greedy. Yeah. You know, let's, let's yeah. See. That's what it, the problem was with me. <laughs> the expression. Uh, Pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly right. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. It's crazy. Yeah. So um, now you know you got the jujitsu going on. What uh, like what's an average day for you? Average day for me is I, and this is kind of how I structured things because you know with the fourth kid we really I wanted to be more present mm-hmm. for being home with the kids. Uh, hopefully we got a good night's sleep with the little one. Yeah. Uh, I wake up at uh, five thirty in the morning. I get up my I get my oldest up. We have breakfast together. Um, send him on his way. He has to catch the bus at six forty five in the morning. Yeah, yeah, which is Early. wild. Yeah, and I I start getting the rest of them up. I take my daughter to school. I put my middle on the bus, and then I come home and it's time to get started with uh, with working mm-hmm. or uh, on like I said three days a week. I I double stack my uh, workout. So I'll do. Uh, jiu-jitsu then i go to the strength training you know skill development before strength development mm-hmm. and i'm able to kind of cut that off in the middle of the day and then uh so like my my 
main focus days are Tuesdays and Thursdays right now. Okay. And then I still kept Fridays as like my finance day. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah, do yeah. all of that on, on Fridays. Ah, that's awesome. So super structured, yeah. sounds yeah. like. Yeah, but with the flexibility to change things if, if needed. Sure. You know, which is kind of like where I was going. Uh, it's funny, I think I told you guys at GS10KSB, I was like, I'm not going to just go full all out into another business. I, I live that hustle life. Now I'm looking for that work balance. Yeah. yeah. So, I like the, I like harmony. That's the word I like to use. Yeah. I feel like balance pins two things against each other. Harmony more sounds like the ebbs and flows of life. Like I love that right now out of everything you just said, like the family is the foundation of it, right? Like you get up, you spend that time with your kids before you get your day started. You fill your cup, you fill their cup, you're hyper present, and then you go take care of business. I think too yeah. many people miss that. As you know, with the 12 year old now, you know, I have four kids as well. And it's like, they grow up like that. That six yeah. month old goes from the, the cute, they smell fantastic to like, oh, you stink, bro. You're like, you're back to just, <laughs> you know, kind of getting on my nerves now, but yeah. you, you can't, miss those moments and it's mm -hmm. like that's what i really feel like success is is having that flexibility of always being able to show up doing the things that you want to do for the people you want to do when you want to do it yeah there was a a real kind of wake-up call for me right because i started my business when my youngest was already born but then the uh my middle child was was born right when i was in the middle of this startup mm -hmm. you know and I was grinding. I was leaving at like 6 a.m., getting home at 8 p.m. And I missed part of his childhood, you know, mm -hmm. like there's yeah. no, I can't get that back. Then COVID hit and I was realized I just had a complete shift in mindset. I'm like, we've got to find this harmony, this balance. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, then this opportunity came up and I was like, yeah, this is perfect for me where I am in life right now. And we decided to have a fourth <laughs> as soon as that opportunity yeah. happened. So, yeah. 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 Well, you know, to Justin's point, it's get, your life goes through ebb and flows, right? Mm -hmm. Like 10 years ago, you were grinding hard as stuff, hard as anything, but it, it allowed you to do what you're doing now. Whereas, you know, if you didn't do that, you could potentially still be doing, you know, having to do that now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I, I one thing I try to teach my kids is sometimes you have to grind, but don't grind yourself to a stump. Yeah. There's many different paths to success and it's not just about hard work and that comes back to that kind of failing fast right like is this working reevaluating and then seeing if what you're doing is the best way forward yeah yeah working smart exactly yeah yeah all right so um we're at 29 yeah okay. so uh get to the end here and i ask all our guests on uh on the podcast at the end Give us or give our listeners a failure that you had. And we kind of just talked a ton about how failure, you know, mm -hmm. but give us a big failure that was like a pivotal point in your life that, you know, you look back on and you're like, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Sure. Um, I mean, early in business, uh, I, we, our revenue wasn't there at, and I had employees and I worked my ass off to make sure that we never missed payroll. Mm. That meant not paying myself many months. Mm -hmm. Looking back, that is a cue that your business is not sustainable and something's not right. Something is mm. broken. If you can't take care of yourself, if you can't be on, you know, like on the airplane, they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself you first. first. Yeah. yeah. If you're not able to do that, you're just going to burn out. And in, in me, it manifested in like, crazy health issues like i started getting alopecia bald spots all over my beard i got facial paralysis and like half oh, wow. oh, like i mean i was really stressed out and yeah. you know so you so learning to fail fast and not just going headlong and you know like gritting your teeth and trying to get through it evaluating stepping out of, outside of things that was a lesson that i learned you know in that the first kind of three four years of business yeah All yeah that. and what um so like during that process what got you out of that you did, did you just keep grinding and so I, I I kept I kept grinding, but then it was to the point where I was like, something's got to change. What do I need to change? It started with me thinking about the sales process, right? Because I looked at what time are we using that's not making us money. And I decided to start shortening our sales process to like we're not going to spend more than two hours of unpaid time with each client. And then as I started thinking about that, I started thinking about all of our business processes. Mm -hmm. And just every time we would just continue to refine, refine. And slowly but surely, you know, it it started to improve to the point where we were profitable. We were doing well. Um, people wanted to work for for us. Clients wanted to work with us. Um, and and then 
as we're successful finding a new business that we liked better and having to step outside and say, do we want to continue on this path or do we want to go on this path? It's it was a very interesting experience. Yeah. But, That's awesome. Yeah. I guess we made the right choice. Yeah. <laughs> obviously you did. Right. right. So it's always 20, 20 man. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was awesome. Mohedi, we really appreciate you being here with us today. For 100%. all of our viewers, make sure, like, subscribe, follow us on all the social media platforms. Mohedi's information will be uh, below in the notes as well, so make sure to give him a follow. But as always, we appreciate you being here with us. Have the best day ever. Best day ever, fam. Yeah.